Go to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. And let me put my... Uh, he was talking to Nicodemus before, so... We'll, we'll put, uh, let's see... John chapter 3. Let's start at verse 16. That's the most popular verse there in, the, in Scripture. I was saying last time that you see uh, little chalk writings on the sidewalk and on the curbs and stuff. Right here in Sacramento County, uh, John 3.16. You see the people up there with their signs at ball games and stuff. Um, although the gospel of grace is not in that verse, what it can do is start someone down the path of uh, learning about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that is an interdispensational truth. Um, let's so, read a couple so verses. Wrong tool for the right job. Wrong yeah. tool for the right job. That's right. Okay. So that's fine. You know, they, 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 Their heart is to share the Lord. So they put John 3.16. It's is an easy verse to learn and so forth like that. But it, like I said, it'll get you, if you desire to know the Lord Jesus and get saved, it'll, it, it, it can begin you on that journey. Look at John 3.16. I'm going to read some of the verses and then we'll have a word of prayer. Uh, John chapter 3. Verse 16, as, as, as the Lord Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, he says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and life in him. We thank you for your Holy Scriptures, Father, which details and lays out uh, just how a person can uh, um, receive the benefit of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus. That today in the dispensation of grace, it's by grace through faith plus no works. And is that, is that faith, our faith resting and trusting what he did on Calvary's cross, how he shed his precious, innocent, powerful blood for our sins. Thank you for that marvelous grace, Father. For those out there who are struggling uh, with, with knowing whether they have that everlasting life, uh, uh, continually have that security. Uh, we thank you that uh, we've done nothing to get saved, and there's nothing we can do or have to do to stay saved. It's all on the basis of your grace. But, Father, we also thank you for his life, for the Spirit of God given to us, Father, so that we might build up Christ's mind and, and build up his life till he be formed in us, Father, as the Apostle Paul says. So, Father, as we look into your word, this prophetic book to the people of Israel, the book of John, May you give us great insight and understanding and wisdom about your prophetic program. Let us rightly divide those things from your mystery program. As well, Father, may, may, may we have a greater appreciation and understanding of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here in John, because it shows Jesus Christ, um, when you were talking about how you were reading uh, John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and those books are confusing if you don't read them with the mindset that they're a futuristic look at the fulfillment of God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel, culminating in the kingdom, which is also the culmination of the new covenant, where he, uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, where he gives his, his life to them by his spirit. He puts it in them, not just upon them, but in them. He gives them that, that, that kingdom, that land, and all those promises, okay? He writes his laws in their heart and calls them to keep the commandments. And because God calls those things which be not as though they were, John shows Jesus as God, the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. He is God. You see seven miracles before his, uh, his resurrection, one after. Eight. Seven is the number of spiritual perfection. So that shows who he is in his life. Eight is the number of new beginning, resurrection life for the nation of Israel. You see in Revelation, it's a futuristic book written by John to show the future kingdom, the wrath and the kingdom. So the books of, that John writes are futuristic look, views at the Lord Jesus and the kingdom after the wrath, okay? So that's why he says this. Look at verse number 16. For God so loved the world. And this is in the context as he gave, he says, as Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Moses lifted up that serpent. That serpent represented the curse. And the Lord Jesus is going to become a curse for all humanity. Now, they don't know that yet. Let me show you that when you read John 3.16, that's not the gospel of grace to Gentiles, okay? It's going to be good news for the Gentiles, but it's going to be after Israel accepts them first. Go with me to John chapter 4. Look at verse 22. The reason why John 3 is not the right verse 
in the context of the dispensation of grace in particular is because you're still dealing on Jewish ground. Notice here, after he says that to a Jewish master, teacher, rabbi, uh, Nicodemus, notice what he says to the Samaritan woman at the well. Verse number uh, 22, John 4, 22. The Lord says to the woman, Ye worship, ye know not what? The Samaritans had set up bell worship there in the northern ten tribes, and the capital was Samaria. And they put, they had them a priesthood and all the other things. They counterfeited God's Levitical priesthood. They didn't come down to Jerusalem to worship where God says to worship. So over the course of time, the, the Samaritans, they were, how did, you know how the, the, the Jews looked at, at the Samaritans? as They might as well be Gentiles. But the Samaritans were part of the, of the, of the covenant uh, that God gave Abraham. They were the ten northern tribes. So what happens here, notice here it says, verse 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. They didn't know what they were worshiping. The show wasn't God. We know what we worship. Jesus is, is a Jew down there in Jerusalem. He says, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the who? The Jews. So in the context of John 3.16, or the context for John 3.16 is if, how God so loved the world, he gave his Jewish son to the Jewish people, and he will be king over the Jewish nation in, on this earth, and that nation will be over all the Gentiles. So that world there, the people of the world, will be under the dominion of the Jewish people in that kingdom. Okay, So you always want to remember that. Today, when you want to tell people how God loves them, Romans 5, 8, Paul, Paul says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us Gentiles. We get it through the blood of Christ and the gospel of the grace of God committed to the apostle Paul. Romans 3, we, we receive for God, uh, whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Colossians said. In Romans 3, he goes through the whole thing. Go over to Romans 3. 3. Go over to Romans 3. From verses 19 on down, the Apostle Paul, I'm just going to give you a couple of verses here. But notice he, said, he talks about the righteousness of God without the law, verse 21. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, it's a dispensational thing. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all, that's Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is what I want you to see. Being justified, how? Freely by his grace. Even in a prophetic program, God loved the world, but you had to do the works of the law. You had to do what God told you to do. There was works and deeds. Here, in the dispensation of grace, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in who? Christ. Christ. He suffered for your redemption. That's the point. He's the suffering one, Jesus. Now, go back to, go back to John. Now, we're just doing a survey, but I just wanted to let you know, I, I appreciate the people who put the, the chalk down there. But Romans 3.20... 324. If you want one, Romans 324, being just Romans 3, 20, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I guarantee you that the people putting that, I guarantee you the people who put in the chalk of John 316, if you put Romans 324 down there, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. They'd have to look it up. What is it? Oh, being just by free. Okay. But that's okay. It could be a stepping stone. And in their baby way. They, they're, they're trying, they, their heart's in the right place. They want, they want to get it out there. But it can start you on that path. The book that I read first, when I, when I first started reading the Bible, the first book I ever read was the book of John. You'll hear, you'll hear denominational people say, you know, when somebody gets saved, tell them to read the book of John. Mine was Ecclesiastes. Oh, no, that's even worse. <laughs> that's, that's even worse. He says his was Ecclesiastes. The book of John... By the way, Ecclesiastes will depress you. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. The book of John is actually the most Jewish of all the books. That's what's funny to me. Okay, I, I would tell him look at Luke. At least Luke shows an all-man ministry of the Messiah. But anyway, in John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's an interdispensation. God wants men, all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world 
to condemn the world. The Lord's purpose was not to come and just destroy everybody. God didn't just put what his purpose for man aside and says, well, forget it. Okay? Like he did with the flood and wanted to do through Moses. God was willing to destroy the entire nation of Israel and start over with Moses. And he could have done it. He did, he did it with Abraham. He did it with Noah. The point is, he could, he could just pick one person and then give them a seed. He could have did that with Moses. And Moses, he said, wait a minute, Lord. If you destroyed your people, all that would do is bring, bring reproach to your name because your enemies would say, hey, he just brought them out to destroy them. God wasn't going to destroy them. He was testing Moses. Moses gave the right answer. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And where that applies for us today in the mystery dispensation is the blood of Jesus Christ will save you today if you trust him. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not, speaking on the Messiah, on Jesus, is condemned already. By the way, you're already condemned. People think, oh, I, I, I need to make this choice as if it's, it's like as if you, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should. No, you should because if you don't, you're condemned. You're going to hell. You're going to go to lake of fire. That's why he says you're condemned already. Because he hath not believed. Now, in context of this, it's believing in the name. He hath not believed in the name. The Jews had to say the name of Christ, Jesus Christ, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. Jesus Christ is that light, right? He's the, he's, the, he's the Word of God. The ultimate light in this world is the Word of God, okay? And men love darkness rather than light. I don't have to tell you grace believers about that. You can just turn on any TV, radio. You can go to this musical right here. You're going to see that. There's a song, it's not a, it's not a Sin to Be Full of Pride. Every time they sing that, I go, yes, it is. <laughs> It is not a sin to be full of pride. Yeah, it is. It is. <coughs> that's the worst thing you can do is be full of pride. That's what, that's what Lucifer had. Pride. Don't make a sign and hold it up during the show. <laughs> be a protest in the show. No, don't do this with my lady. I know you. I, you can't come. <laughs> Destiny can come. You can't come. <laughs> Verse number 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. The reason why thieves do things in the co under the cover of darkness at night is because they don't want to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. Chris and I believe we watched a, uh, a drug deal go down right at Fair Oaks. <laughs> this is this guy doing all this, and it was broad daylight right there, and it was right in the open, people walking by. It's like 6 o'clock, still light up. She goes, I got probably. <laughs> I'm like, man, they just bowed. <laughs> Because the Fair Oaks doesn't have a police department, the Sacramento County Sheriff. Doesn't. Anyway, usually they do it under cover of darkness, right? And that's what he's saying. He says, men don't love the light of God's word because their deeds are evil. They don't want to hear. By the way, when you try to share these truths with people, the reason why more people don't, don't, aren't here and, and believe in this, they don't want it to be true. They don't want it to be true. Why? Their deeds are evil. They don't want truth. They don't want to be held accountable by God. Look at verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. That's the truth, isn't it? Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Do you know the greater, the, the closer you come to light, the more you can see the impurities. Isn't that true? Yeah. You know why they put makeup on men who are on TV? Because if you're ever, and I've been on TV sets and stuff, recording stuff, those lights are so bright. When you go, if you go to Jay Lynn's production, they're going to have spotlights. By the way, Jay Lynn always makes her way up front into the spotlight. <laughs> she, she be pulling back in. The lady said, You over there? Okay, I get back. She wants to get up front. She's made for the spotlight. You know. Under the spotlight, Annie said. But the closer you get to those bright lights, when those, those TV lights, they're hot and they look bright. They put makeup on because you don't want to be looking, oh, you know, like a zombie or something, right? Well, you can, the, the brighter the light, the more you can see your impurities. When you come, the closer you come to God's Word, the more you get into it and study it and see yourself, the more you see, man, I'm a mess. Mm -hmm. But God wants you to see that. He's not angry. He wants you to come so that He can heal us up, right? 
That's what he's saying. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth, right? That person has that heart for the truth. Cometh to the light. You don't run from the Lord. You come to the Lord, right? You say, Lord, I'm a mess. I see it. Compared to you and your word, I'm a mess. He says, good. I'm glad you acknowledge that. Come on, let me clean you up. Notice that. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, in the truth here, with those who were keeping God's law, to the best of their ability, obviously nobody can keep it perfectly, they had to offer the sacrifice. But those Jews who were righteous in their hearts, who, de who, de who desired the truth, they actually wanted to get close to the word of God, his life. Verse 22, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. Uh, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Now, he goes down into the southern territory of the nation, Judea. You hear him say Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and so forth. He goes down to the southern territory of, of Judea. Verse number 23. And John also was baptizing in Anon. Um, I told you, last time I told you that Nicodemus, his name means victory of the people. Uh, Nico, you, you, you ever have a pair of Nikes, N-I-K-E, those, those shoes? Yeah. Nike, that means victory. That's why... That's why they adopted that name, and all the athletes wear Nikes, or most of them, because it means victory. Nicodemus, victory of the people. He's going to represent uh, those Jews who are, who are believers. They're going to have victory. Uh, go down to verse number 23 again. I'm sorry, what was it? 23. And John also was baptized in Anon near Salim. Uh, the word Anon means cloud or fountain of water. Uh, it's like a water cloud. Something that bears uh, water, okay? A cloud full of water, Ammon. Um, the word Salim, verse 23, means, well, you could probably almost get that. Salim, Salim, means peace. Like Salom, Shalom, Shalom, Asalam. Salim means peace. All right, verse 23. And John also was baptized, uh, baptized in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. By the way, let me say this about John. John the Baptist, he went to these different places where much water was, okay? Because he wanted the people to gather there. John was baptizing these people there. And they came and were baptized. And again, by the way, verse 24, John looking for John the writer. That was John the, Bapt uh, John the Baptist, verse 23. Verse 24, for John was not yet cast into prison. Now, we're going to get to it, but John was cast into prison. Anybody remember why? Yeah. Yeah. He, he actually told Herod, the, the evil Jewish king, that it was wrong to have his brother Philip's wife, right? He told him the truth from the law. And instead of that man saying, oh, I must repent. Oh, I'm, this, you know, I'm letting down the God of Israel. Because Herod was a Jew. He says, he, he's, he has this woman talk him into cutting, putting John in prison and eventually cutting his head off, right? Okay? So he was evil. That's right. Because even though he did that, didn't he admire John? Uh, like He did. He would bring John to here. Yeah, yeah. here. But he, he didn't do enough. That's yeah. right. He shouldn't have done that. Verse 25. For there, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. By the way, John has disciples. He has followers. Eventually, his followers will be, will go to the Lord Jesus, okay? You see this right here? We're, the, the title I put it on here is, He Must Increase. John didn't want men to be focused on him. He only wanted them to be focused on his ministry temporarily, right? For about a six-month period. He's a few, uh, six months, uh, yeah. Forerunner. Right, he's the forerunner. Eventually, John was to bring the people of Israel to who? The Messiah, right? Okay? And one of the reasons I believe that God allowed John to be put in prison, yea, God allowed, he didn't cause it, because Herod did it in unbelief, but God allowed John. If, if John's in prison, God could have easily done like he did with Peter, send an angel, break him out of prison, easily. But the reason I think that God allowed John to go to prison and eventually die is because the Lord Jesus must increase, right? And if those men had any doubts, 
Those men following John had any doubts, his disciples. With John dead, they don't have any. They, there's no more man to follow, right? He's dead. So there, there's, there was that. But also John's ministry was over. Just like the Apostle Paul, when his ministry was over, the Roman governor, the Roman government put him to death. God allowed the Roman government to put him because he's done. Now he's going to go be with the Lord. Same with John. John's going to go to the uh, to, to paradise. All right? He's, his, his ministry is done. Verse number 25. Then there arose a question between some of, the, of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Uh, purifying was a religious uh, um, custom about with, with water and so forth, cleansing. Verse 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, there, he's speaking about Jesus, behold, the same baptizes and all men come to him. Now John, who wasn't looking for the praise of men, John who had zero pride, notice how he answers. John who understood what his ministry was for. Verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. You guys remember when they asked him, are you the Messiah? He says, no, it's not me. But that I am sent before him, that forerunner. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. John is saying, I'm like the best man. The best man is not the one who's supposed to receive the glory. He's the friend of, 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 the, of the groom, right? Give the groom glory. He's comparing the Lord Jesus as the groom. We call the bridegroom. Verse number 29. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He's saying if you guys recognize who Jesus is as your Messiah, I'm, I'm joyful. My, my job is done. Verse 30. He must what? Increase. But not just he must increase. Notice John's humility. But I must decrease. John wants to take. How many men do that? How many men naturally say, I'm going to take the focus off of me and put it on someone else? We're in this political season and everybody, they want, they want, to, they all mad because one candidate is getting all the, the you know, most of the, the coverage and stuff like that. They don't know. Look at me. Look at me. Remember that one guy at the debate? Oh, quiet Ben Carson. Nobody talk about him. He goes. Somebody talk about me, please. <laughs> Somebody pick on me. Because all the questions were from Trump, 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 and all about Trump. And Ben Carson over there, he's going, Somebody pick on me. Sweet lips. Like, he goes, I heard my name. <laughs> you know. How many people really say, take the spotlight off of me and put it on someone else? Well, John did that. By the way, humble people do that. You want to put the spotlight on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We we get we get emails, texts, phone calls. And they'll say, Brother Ron, man, you help me understand this, that, area. And you know what? My answer to them is praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus. This is my job. I'm the vessel. We're the vessel. You give him the glory. And that's my answer. Praise the Lord. I'm just, this, uh, I'm just a human vessel. Well, that was John. Notice he says, verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. Who is that? That's the Messiah. He come from above. He's above all. He that is of the earth is earthly. That's John. And speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all, the Messiah. Verse 32. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testified, and no man receiveth his testimony. You remember the Lord said to Nicodemus? He says, if I tell you about earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you about... If you wanted to know what goes on in heaven, you could have just asked the Lord Jesus, and it would be unbelievable what he had to tell you. Think about that. If you went to Jesus of Nazareth and said, tell me about that, he, he operated in, in a different dimensional, he had no dimensional limitations, my point. Even his stories were heavenly. Exactly. Think about this. How did he know, check this out. In Luke 16, he says, hey, there was a rich man and there was Lazarus the beggar. The angels carried Lazarus' soul to, to paradise. How did he know that? He could see that stuff. Yeah. He could see there. He was telling you what's going on down there. I can't explain it. Adam messed that up for the rest of us, obviously. God shut that part off of, of humanity. But the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't limited dimensionally, what he can see. He, he can see. He can, we, we asked the question. Um, I don't know if it was Rondell. Maybe it was, no, it was, uh, it was um, Cheryl. She said, can Satan read your mind? Satan cannot read your mind. 
His angels can't read your mind. The devils can't read your mind. What they can do is the moment you reveal something, or they can watch you, and so a medium can tell you, you got an uncle named John, you gave him a red sweater back in 87 on they Christmas. Watch, they watch you. They watch you. They study you. They, can, they study you. Now, Satan got enough, he got enough experience over 6,000 years of dealing with humanity, you might think he can read your mind, right? But he can't. He can't. But the moment you let something out, then he got you, right? But the point is, Jesus of Nazareth could read your mind. There was a song back in from my day, back in the 90s, I can read your mind, baby, you know. <laughs> no, you can't. You're not the Lord Jesus. Only the Lord Jesus. But he can know their thoughts. It'll say, and Jesus knowing their thoughts. Check that out. He'll say things like this. Why think ye in your hearts? And you're saying, he would tell them what they were thinking. Only God can do that. Only God can read your mind. Satan can, all right? All right, let's keep going. So he can tell you about what's above Verse number 32, and what he has seen and heard, that he testified, that no man received his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For those who did believe Jesus' words, they see that God is true. Why would that be true? God promised Israel a Messiah. Two men are spoken of the most in Scripture. Two men. The Christ and the Antichrist. The Lord Jesus Christ, his coming, the Messiah, and the anti-Messiah, the one who opposed the Messiah, those two men, okay, <clears throat> are foretold in Scripture. Let me say it like that. Verse 34, for he whom God hath sent, excuse me, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, that's the Messiah, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Uh, on Sunday, Matthew asked about Romans 12, about what is the measure of faith? God has dealt to everyone the measure of faith. It's also called in Romans 12, the proportion of faith. There's something called the faith. There's the mystery of Christ, right? The faith of Christ. And in order to bring unity into the, to the body of Christ, God has given everyone, especially in the beginning there, the, the spiritual gifts, he given everybody, he dealt like cards. Like a, a deck of cards is 52 and you give everybody something. And he wants you to give, take what he's given you and, and put it back in the hole, every joint supply, right? Right. Well, Jesus was different. Everything that God had, he put into his son. Jesus had anything that God gave to humanity, gifts of the Spirit, miracles, resurrect, anything. Everything God gave was in his son. Not only that, Jesus Christ was the living word of God. From his age zero to like 12. He was in that stage, and then you saw him in Luke at the temple, right? And it says that he grew in wisdom and stature and so forth. So for the next 18 years to age 30, okay? These are the, these are the unknown years. There's all types of stuff out there, uh, Jewish legends and lores, that even little Jesus would do these things. And it might, it might be some truth to that because John says, I'm only recording miracles, a, a bit of the miracles. And all these miracles that he records, those eight, teach doctrine. He would pick up little birds that die, touch them and heal them, they fly out. All this stuff, anyway, he would take it away. But the Bible is silent about these years from 12 to 30. But here's what we know. The Word, John 1, became what? John 1, 14. Flesh. And what you see is from, from, his, from 0 to 30, the flesh became the Word. Think about that. And at age 30, when he began his ministry, there was nothing about God's Word that Jesus did not know. He was literally the living Word of God. I, um, there's a guy named Jack Van Empey. Jack Van Empey. He comes on in the morning out here, and we, we look at him, you know. He's all over the place. He talked about Catholic brother, and he, 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 he's real strong against Islam and stuff like that. So he's a, he's a tough old bird there. He is. I, get, I, I like his zeal. And the one, thing I, the one thing I appreciate the most about Jack, he is memorized. Now, this is scary. He's memorized every verse of the Bible. But because he doesn't rightly divide, he mixes it up. So that's scary. Because if you would think if somebody knew every verse in the Bible, and he's an old man now, he's in his 80s. But his recall is awesome. So I, I do admire that. The sad part is 
you can know every, you know what's sad? You can know every verse of the Bible, but if you don't rightly divide the scriptures, you're going to mix things up, be all over the place. But I give him credit, he is, and I'm sure he's just like me. He was born with that ability to remember things that interest him when he reads them. But that's going to be my, my, my drive to know every verse. And if you know the verse is rightly divided, then you can actually get understanding. That's the Lord. When it says in verse 34, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words, words of God, Jesus Christ knew every... By the way, when the devil tempted him in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, right? And he says, the devil says to him, turn those stones into bread. If you're the son of God, I know you're hungry. You've been out here 40 days. Turn the stones to bread. What was his answer? Man shall not live by bread alone. But notice this. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God shall man live. And, and to him, he wasn't... He wasn't exaggerating. He knew every word of God in the prophetic program. He now, even tried to hit him with scripture, right? Oh, that's, Satan. Yeah, Satan did that. He realized, oh boy, I got to come with scripture yeah. with this guy. But like he tells his half truths like a politician. Yeah. You know what politicians do? They give you half a truth. Half truths, a whole lot. <laughs> and one guy said, I beat that guy in six states. The guy said, but I beat you in 20. You didn't tell people that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All politicians are just like snakes. When I'm looking at them, I just, they might as well be just snakes yeah. slithering up there. Ugh. there. I can't let Crystal watch anything political. Yeah. She'd get hot. She, 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 this woman is a righteous woman. She says, they're liars. I go, yes, yeah. dear. See, I, I, we got to protect her. But can I tell you something? The Lord Jesus Christ says, man shall, live by, uh, not, man shall not live by bread alone. You need bread to live. But by every word that proceeds out of the God. He was the only man living who knew every word of God perfectly. Jack Van Empey might know the verses, but he doesn't even understand anything about the mystery today. The Lord Jesus didn't have that problem. Notice here, verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So in everything that the Spirit of God want for a man, Jesus had. Okay? All right. By the way, if you have perfect recall, it wasn't limited. Not limited. Imagine having perfect recall, total recall. Remember Arnold Schwarzenegger, total awesome. recall. Awesome. Imagine everything that God reveals to you, he gives you light, you retain it. No wonder he could be like a living, he was a living Bible at age 30, man. Now, we don't have perfect recall because of the curse of sin and in these vile bodies, but can I tell you this? You can spend time reading and studying God's word, and again, the local assembly, to add to that, to strengthen you and so forth on the journey. But although we would never be like that, this side of glory, because he didn't have a vile body, right? He didn't have sin. We can build up and understand. We can build Christ in us, okay? And God wants us to learn the mystery. Don't worry about all the details of the Old Testament. I don't know them all because I'm not spending my time looking at all the details of the prophetic program. But what I do want to do is dig into the mystery, Paul's doctrine, <laughs> And I thank God I have you guys to do that with as well, okay? All right, verse 35. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. Again, one of the, the roles of a son is to rule over the Father's inheritance, right? The Lord Jesus is the ultimate Son. Verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God does what? Abideth on him. And you see that? That's interdispensational. If you don't believe God's message to you, his wrath is abiding upon you. And, and in, even today, God has been long-suffering, right? The dispensation of grace is a long-suffering. Christ showing long-suffering. But one day, God is going to say enough to this world, take us home very soon, and he's going to begin to pour out his wrath. We saw that on Sunday. Jesus Christ is going to come with flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and believe not his gospel. We're going to see it this Sunday, okay? Now, if you don't believe on the Lord today in the dispensation of grace, same is true. The wrath of God. He calls you a child of wrath, children of wrath, right? Then Paul calls call them that? Children of wrath, even as others. All right, chapter 4. When, <clears throat> when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. By the way, the Lord is listening to the Pharisees. Don't they compare it to as like um, 
Superman. There's a lot of symbolism in Superman. He can be in one room and he can hear a conversation over there, right? The Lord didn't have to be amongst the Pharisees to know what they were thinking because he knew all men, by the way. Notice here. He knew that once they realized John is less popular than Jesus now, the Pharisees are going to take their focus and put it on Jesus. They're opposing for... Mankind is so predictable. Even in the political world. I tell Krista, I can see, I'm intrigued by stuff like that. I like warfare, pushing things back and forth. Because physical warfare is like spiritual warfare. But I can see how, even in politics, they take their attack on one guy. And then, when they see another guy popular, they stop with that guy and they go with that guy. That's what's going to happen with the Lord. Watch, what he's, watch, watch verse 4, verse 1, chapter 4. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. You know what they're looking at? They're going, hmm, we got a problem. John was a problem. The people of Israel are following that guy. But he's not our biggest problem. So let's leave him alone for a minute. <clears throat> our biggest problem is this Jesus. we got to have a plan of attack for him. That's politics right there, everybody. They do the same thing. Look at verse 2. Just so you'll know, John puts the parenthesis here, the parenthetical. Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, okay? Um, Jesus wasn't sitting there like John and, and baptizing the people. But he gave authority, he delegated that authority to his 12 disciples, okay? All right, verse 3. He left Judea, so he leaves the southern territory of Israel and departed again into Galilee. Uh, I don't have my map up here, but if you just look on your Bible map, the southern territory, Galilee is in the northern territory, okay? All right. Now, because he's in that region, look at verse 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now, why does he go through Samaria? We, you can, this is more of a survey, so write down these passages. If you read the New Covenant of Jeremiah 31.31, 31, he says, he says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The house of Israel, the house of Israel were the northern tribes. The house of Judah, for David's sake, were the southern tribes, okay? Ten and two. Galilee, south yeah. Judea. Right, so Galilee is up here in the north. And so is Samaria. Samaria was the capital of of Israel. When I say Israel, the, the, when they broke the prior <coughs> power. Okay? When they were Israel and Judah in the Old Testament, Samaria was the capital of Israel. It was where they set up the Baal worship. They had a father, a priest. He got vestures. He got him a, a robe, a collar. And he, just, he might as well have been in the Roman Catholic Church. Because that's what it was. They didn't want to come down here to the temple in Jerusalem. So Jesus heads back up there. Now he did it on purpose. Look, look how this said it. Verse number four. And he must needs go through Samaria. That's not like somebody from the hood saying that. He must needs go through Samaria. I know a guy talked just like that back in Inglewood, Chicago. He must needs go. What he's saying is he did that on purpose. Why? Jeremiah 31 says, verse 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant what I made with their fathers on the day where I took them uh, by the hand and brought them out of Egypt, which covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them. But this shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel in those days. So God, like he tells the prophet, you take two, two sticks, you take one stick and another stick, and you make them one again. And God, after Solomon, he broke the pride of their power. Bam, bam. They were getting too heady and high-minded, so God broke the pride of their power. They became two different nations. By the way, they fought a lot, too, which is crazy. Okay? They even fought amongst themselves. The tribes fought. If you read that, they're the most dis You think you got a dysfunctional family? The Hebrew people do. Different tribes will kill each other. It was stupid, but you see that in Islam, don't you? The stuff that goes on in the Middle East, it goes all the way back. Different sects of Islam fight each other and kill each other. Different tribes. Well, Israel was doing that. And it, so the point is, he broke the pride of their power. But God never intended it to stay that way. So in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, you can read on your own time, 
He says, I made a covenant. And by doing that covenant, Jesus Christ came to speak to those people. Now watch this. With our time left, I want you to see this interaction with this woman at the well. It's fantastic. Let's look at it. Samaria. He's in Samaria. First, he must needs go through because it's part of his duty, right? Right. And he must needs go through Samaria. Verse 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob and his son, uh, Jacob gave his son Joseph. Uh, if you want to look at that, you can go back to the book of Genesis. Um, I believe this, I, I believe this is the, there, I, I believe it was uh, Shechem, but it's, or Sychar, it, it's, it's spelled a little bit different in the Old Testament, but you can read that in Genesis. Uh, Jacob, it's a parcel of ground Jacob gave to his son Joseph, okay? Well, I see it. Okay, you got that? All right, good, good. Okay. What does it say? What does it say there? What does Sychar. Oh, good. Yeah, okay, good. There you go. Well. So you got the new, that's the New Testament times of the Lord. It's, it's called something different in, in the Old Testament, but same, same parcel, okay? Right. Verse number six. Now Jacob's well was there. Okay, I got, I got, I got a note in my own Bible. Yeah. That's Genesis 24. Y'all can see that. Jacob's now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being what? Wearied. Now why would that be interesting if, if you're thinking about who Jesus is? He is God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. right. But he was 100% God. He, he wasn't 50-50, you know. His body was weak. Yeah, well, yes, because he was still a human being. He, was a, he wasn't like 50% God, 50% man. No, no, no. He was he was the most unique person, creature ever. He was 100% God, yet at the same time, 100% man. In Isaiah 40, verse 28, it says that God, he neither sleeps nor slumbers or gets weary. But can I tell you, man does, doesn't do, don't we? You know what's interesting about him being weary? He so took upon man, he, he took upon himself man, humanity, Even being weary, that means you're tired and sleepy and so forth. You're worn down, right? right. That's part of the curse. Right. Adam, before the curse, would not get worn down. He had energy. He had light. He had God's glory operating. He had God's power source. So Jesus was so affiliated with humanity that he himself could get tired. He also could get hungry. He could get thirsty. It blows my mind because he's God in the flesh. He got hungry. He got... By the way, you remember the one where they were in the boat? He literally said he got him a pillow. I got I, I to get this pillow called My Pillow. Y'all yeah. see the commercial My Pillow? Mm -hmm. From Minnesota Homeboy Bay. You wake up, after 40, you start waking up with your neck problems and stuff. While we're in Minnesota, we got to go check the factory out. The My Pillow <laughs> factory, you know, the pillow. It said that the Lord, he, he, it actually, he slept on a pillow, right? Now, he says, we got to go to the other side, guys. They said, okay, Lord. And purposely, God sends winds and waves and storms, and they're waking them up. Lord, we perish. He go, you a little faith. Didn't I tell you we're going to have some? Trust me. And then what did he do? He says, peace be still. He, he calms the wind. And you know why he did that? Because the psalm says, who is he that can gather the waters in his wind and stop the winds and the waves? It is, the, it is him. It was the Lord, right? He was showing them he was that prophesied Messiah that psalms was talking about. But he also got on him. He says, if I say we go on the other side, I don't care what happens. And another thing, that thing where he slept on the pillow and, and, and him being asleep, that's, that's what it's going to look like God is in the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation, right? They're going to be like, where are you, God? These Muslims are destroying our people. They're, 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 they're bombing us. They're cutting heads off. Where are you? He's... It's symbolic that he just rests his sleep. But the believing remnant, the believing remnant, they're going to go through it too. And they're looking for him like, Lord, help us. He says, didn't I tell you? He said, on the cross, why have you forsaken me? That's right. And his was different, but yeah, that's a good point. As they go through this tribulation period, the, the believing remnant, the little flock, he already told them, you will get to the other side. You're going to get through. Some of you guys might be martyred and die. Others are going to walk through, walk into the kingdom, but you're going to make it to the other side. That's what all that's symbolic, okay? Let's go back to this. So he, 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 he sees the, um, he, he's, he's thirsty. Look at verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. 
Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey. By the way, he took a long journey, so he got tired, right? Mm -hmm. Thus sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. I was telling Krista, yeah. the Lord Jesus Christ had every personality. Um, if you think about how God made the earth, four is the number of the earth and so forth, and we're made of the dust of this ground, and, the, and the, it, it's, a, it's a lot to go through, but God makes people and their personalities uh, kind of like the, the elements of the earth. It's weird. Uh, you get some people, my personality is like the Mississippi River, like water. I can bring a peace and a calm, you know. Mm. Jada Land is like Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them is water. I'm just, Chris and I are like this. Jada Land is like, <laughs> <laughs> Rondell's like that too. Mm -hmm. Rondell's like that too. She's tired of I think about the Lord Jesus oh, Christ. Oh, I'm, I'm just sure. Okay, just let me done. Yeah, we'll be done about 15 minutes. I was just joking about that, but you are. No, you, no, you I know. Like Rachel's like that. Rachel is too. <laughs> I wouldn't go bother Rachel. She might throw something at me. <laughs> <laughs> so she is like that. She, she like with Niagara Falls. I got to leave now. We love that. By the way, you're born that way. Yeah. But here's the point. When I look at the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's a representation of Adam, the humanity, every. He has everything. He has the artistic side of him. Uh, very creative. He's the creator. He has that compassionate side, brings calm to people. He has that determined side. Peace. I, I, well, that the peace would be the, the calm, that, 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 like, the, like the Mississippi, right? He has that. He brings peace to a situation. But he had a zeal and a determination like fire. When he was in that temple, he made those chords. You wouldn't even believe it was the same guy, right? He was, he has all of that. And he could listen to someone and just give the right word, boom, like that. He just was on it. Like, if, he's a very interesting, I can see, I, I study personalities in people dealing with ministry. And I know how to handle people. You can't handle every personality the same, you know that? Kristen, J, Kristen and I are so different than our daughter. She was born, she was born that way. She helped me understand personality. We're quiet, we're introverts, we don't want to deal with people. She said, where the party at, man? Where the party at? <laughs> we got to take her out every day just so she can be around people. Go to you. Remember what you said about your husband, Dick? He was more introverted. Take you to the party an hour, he ready to go home. That's right. And you didn't understand that until later, but you're, you're a people person. If you would have known that, you said, okay, take me, and then you go home or in the next room, whatever, let him chill out to recover. That's how I am, you know? Well, the Lord Jesus was that way, too, at times. He had to go and be away and recover. So he had, my point is, I, I love the Lord, and I'm going to examine this, because he had every personality. He, whatever it needed, he had all the personalities that he could deal with stuff. Notice here, even though he was weary, he knew exactly where to go. He knew exactly where to go. I'm going to Father Jacob's well, because there's a woman there waiting on me right now, is my point. He was calculating. <laughs> Not like politicians calculate things to lie to you. He calculated this to give her truth. Right. I love this. And who better to tell if you want something known than a woman? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Yes, you did. I'm just joking. But, but, but for real deal, though, he knew that this woman would go back and tell people. I was joking about that. But that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Don't tell nothing to my girl. Uh, mine either. She got scratched by a cat in Seattle when they were there. And she, that day we came back, on Wednesday, she says, Daddy, don't tell anybody at church I got scratched. I don't want them to know. I don't want she them to know. She made me at the door. She made me at the door. She told me. As soon as we got to church, she was sitting at the door like a greeter. I got a cat. I got scratched by a cat. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell her nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to tell this woman. He knows what he's doing with this woman because he knows she don't go back and tell everybody. But this is a good thing to tell. Let's look at it. Verse number six. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Six hour on that, on that Jewish calendar. Is that noon? Uh, that would be noon because you start at 6 a.m., right? And work your way six hours. The third hour of the day, Acts 2, was 9 a.m., and then the sixth hour will be, so it's in the middle of the day in the noonday sun, right? right? So it's the hottest day in the Middle East there. Let's keep going. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. 
Now that's, that, that sounds like Rachel when she came to grow. Anyway, Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. So he sends his disciples to the city to buy food. He goes to give him a drink of water, but he, he's calculating with this. This is my point. Verse 9. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew? How did she know? Ah, oh, how does she know? Well, obviously there was some type of distinguishing, distinguishing features. It could have been his look, his hair, his dress, you know, yes, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, he would know, yeah. Sorry. Okay, no, that's that's fine. It says, she says, how, how, uh, how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? Now watch this. It didn't say that the Samaritans had any dealing, no dealings with the Jews. Watch how she says it. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She's shocked that here's a Jewish man who even talking to her. Because the Jewish people, their Jewish brethren down there, had so alienated themselves from them, or separated themselves, that it was almost, they were called Galilee of the Gentiles, basically. Doing their own thing. Right. Now watch this. Verse 10. By the way, the Good Samaritan, our daughter asked about the Good Samaritan. A lot of hospitals are called either Mercy Hospital or Good Samaritan Hospital. Right. She was like, well, tell us about that story. And what a Samaritan was, the Good Samaritan was a type of the Lord Jesus, right? Here's a Jewish man. He gets beat half dead, Luke says. And a priest, a Levite, the priestly tribe, and, and go by and they do nothing for the man. Nothing. They're, they're Israelites. They did nothing for this man. And they should, right? Mm -hmm. You got a priest and you got of, this, of the priestly tribe. They should have been ministering to people and they do nothing for them. They're half dead. They're only, they're only, he's about to die. And here, not a Jew, but a Samaritan, the people that the Jews hate, comes and heals his wound, puts oil and wine, patches him up, puts him on his own uh, donkey there, and, and takes him to the inn, tells the innkeeper, I'm on my journey, here's money, take care of him, if, 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 if I owe you anything, I'll pay you when I get back. See how he treated him? He showed mercy, right? Yeah. And, and, and he's telling, that, that story tells these Jews, that's how you are neighbor, that's how you love your neighbor. You, you are your brother's keeper, you take care of them, right? Love your enemy. And he uses the most despised people, besides the Romans, right? He uses these Samaritans to show Jews. He uses their enemies to show them. He always used like a gent. He'll say, I, I haven't seen such faith, no, not amongst Israel. That's crazy. Yeah, That's it's crazy. crazy. That's he, crazy. What, what he does, what he does is he's 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 reproving them. He's saying, look, these Gentiles and this Samaritan, they're more loving and gracious than you are, and you should be the example. That's true. It says in the, about the book of Enoch that those fallen angels who, who committed the sin of coming to strange human flesh, they cried to Enoch, go talk to God. You, you walk with God. Go talk to him on our behalf that he might be merciful. He says, okay. God says, go back and tell them they should be, the angels should be looking for the best for mankind, not the opposite. So he kind of reproved him. He says, they should be intervening for man, not man for them. So God says, tell them they get no, this is crazy. He says, they get no mercy. All right, keep going. Verse 7. Ten. I'm sorry, verse 10. See what you did, though? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou, now here's the, here's the point. We've got 10 minutes. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given the what? Living water. Living water. I got a note here, Jeremiah 2.13. I normally, since we serve him, but I'm going to go back there and read that to you. Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. There it is. If you want to show someone about the Lord Jesus Christ being the, 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 the Old Testament God, for my people have committed two evils. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot, that, that can hold no water. no water. A cistern is like a canister. He, he says, these dummies, they refuse the flowing living water, 
But then they go and get them some containers that can't contain any water. They made them some containers that got holes in them. That's how dumb they are. Isn't that ridiculous? That's, what, that's probably why I wrote that. When I read the Old Testament, a verse of New Testament common, then I say, oh yeah, okay. So that's what he's saying. Go back to John 4, 10. That's how the Spirit works. Yeah, yes, exactly. It's, it, it, it compares these verses so you can gain some understanding. Right. And, and he, he is that fountain of living water, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's the embodiment of it. Verse number uh, 10 at the end. And he would have given the living water. Now, like any other human being, they, they don't get it, right? Watch this. The woman said unto him, Sir, <laughs> isn't this funny? Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. She's coming with baskets he's and things. and he's, ah. he's speaking heavenly. Right. She thinking, he's saying, um, yeah, there, there might be a, a well of water over there that I could give you water from. Uh -uh, notice this. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is what? Deep. Deep. You out right now? Yeah. Yeah, go rest. We'll see you Sunday. Okay. Go better, yeah. The woman said unto him, verse 11, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. That was Jacob's well. From whence then hast thou th that living water? Now, everybody watch this. Art thou greater than our father who? Jacob. So you know they come from Jacob. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they, they were of his tribes. Which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, that's in Genesis, and his children and his cattle. That was the exact well. Verse 13. G By the way, can I, can I add this? That's where Hagar was at too, right? Ah, yes, yes. Watch this. The reason he goes to Jacob's well, well, let me say this. The reason that, incident, that, 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 that account of Jacob's well in Genesis is because that Jacob's well represents the Messiah. The fountain of living water. Yeah, he, he sustained it. Sustained yeah. our fathers, yeah. our people, and our cattle. Yeah. Jesus Christ goes to that same well and says, that's me. Mm -hmm. Y'all get that symbol? Yeah, yeah. Watch this, watch this. Watch this, watch what he said. Verse number 13, Jesus answered said unto her, Whoso drinketh of this water shall what? Thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall what? Never yeah, thirst. thirst. You know how Paul says in, 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 in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, he says, verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, male or female, we've all been made to drink into one Spirit. Where do we get our thirst quenched? In the physical realm, yeah, by the lead, in, lead tainted, chlorine tainted water. <laughs> Unless you buy it, right? <clears throat> but can I tell you, spiritually speaking, where you get your thirst quenched is the living Word of God and by the Spirit of God. You see that? And that's what he's saying. Look, he's saying, if you drink that water, you're going to thirst again, verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Think about this. Do you understand that God can give you, he can give you more You'll never be thirsty for spiritual light as long as you desire God's word. Because you can't. You can't get enough. One of the brothers, Matt, he talks about it'd be like trying to feed a, a chihuahua and water through a fire hose, okay? He's like, shh. <laughs> <laughs> you got your mouth open. God, that's God. He'll just keep giving it to you, you know. He'll say, let's put a clamp on that and take it in through a straw, you know. You don't want to spray. But the point is, you'll never thirst with the word of God. You know that? As long as you desire it, God will give you more. That's what he's saying. Let's keep reading. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well. In him. Is he going to give him the spirit? A well of water springing up into what? Everlasting life. In that kingdom, he's going to fulfill that Jeremiah 31 promise to both Israel and Judah. And he's going to give them the spirit and the word. That's what he's talking about. Let's keep going. The woman said unto him, so we got five minutes, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. <laughs> and, well, I would, yeah. Neither come to draw. Uh -huh. earthly water. Neither come here to draw. <laughs> uh, well, little does she know, as long as she's living, she's still got to have the well water, right? Yeah. But spiritually, he can do something. Now, now, by the way, in that kingdom, although we will eat, it won't be because we're hungry. Uh, 
although although we will drink, it wouldn't mean just thirsty. Eating and drinking is is a pleasurable thing God gave. It's a gift God gave to man. Enthusiastic, right? That's what it's exactly. Saying. It's a gift to God. The Lord says, I will not drink henceforth of this until we drink anew with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. So although in your resurrected body, you and I won't need to eat and drink, we will still eat and drink. Ryan already got us going down to the Mount of Olives to enjoy the olives <laughs> on the earth. See, we already, we already got that. We already got that appointment scheduled, okay? <laughs> That's probably the, the only olives that's better than sunshine in the bottle or in Modesto. That's, that's probably the only ones that's better. Okay. All right. But I can tell you, she's going to have to drink water this side of that, but in that kingdom, she's going to have that everlasting life. Verse 15, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Now, we're coming down, so I can't really get into it. We'll pick up this one. This one um, be like... So we got we got Colossians, First Peter, yeah, it'll be a few weeks. So Y'all gotta be patient. But we're gonna look at this. He says, "Go call thy husband and come hither." Now, there's cultural thing. Obviously, he's gonna talk to the husband. He's the spiritual leader and so forth. But there's something about the number of husbands that this woman had that we're gonna look at next time. Notice this, verse 17. The woman answered and said, "I have no husband." Jesus said unto her, "By the way, he knows everything, right?" Thou hast said, has well said, I have no husband. He was testing her honesty there. <clears throat> Can I tell you, it wasn't a prideful thing in that culture to not have a husband. It was a shameful thing if you were a young woman and didn't have a husband, okay? That's one thing we'll look into next time. But let me show you something else. He not only knew she didn't have a husband, he told her how many, how many <laughs> she did in the past. For thou hast had... Five husbands. And the sixth one, she wasn't, married. she wasn't married to. She just gave up on that. She's like, it ain't for me, man. I tried five. But there's some, there's, some, there's some doctrinal things related to Israel here, too, I'm going to show next time. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that's, in that says thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Um, I'll go down to verse 22, and we'll pick up this passage next time we're in John. Our fathers worshipped, verse 20, in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. When, he, when she says ye, she says ye Jews. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Mm -hmm. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship his Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Last verse. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, in our next time in John, we'll pick up the issue of the husbands and all this in spirit and truth, okay? Uh, if you're listening to this study, you guys hear us say, but someone's listening to this study online, um, and you don't have that assurity of salvation, everlasting life, today in grace, the same principle applies. You must trust the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You must believe he shed his blood on that cross of Calvary for your sins. Now, the difference is they needed to work righteousness in the name of Jesus. You don't need to work righteousness to get, to get, get into his kingdom. You need to believe that he is your only way. And through his shed blood, God the Father will save you that moment. Now, your works of righteousness come afterwards, and that affects not your salvation, but your reward. We'll help you with both of those, okay? All right. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth, for your love, for your grace in Christ. Thank you for this wonderful book of John. It, it's a book that's close to my heart, Father. It's the first uh, book that I read all the way through in Scripture. And I, 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 I got a taste and fell in love with your son, Jesus. Even if it was according to prophecy, his, his love, his miracle-working power, I realized he was like no other man ever. And so, Father, thank you for that, that journey to, begin, to end it with uh, understanding of the gospel of grace and, and growing in that truth. We pray that the Lord Jesus Christ, through this, uh, through this study, there might be someone out there who begins this journey uh, to, to, to learn the truth of, 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 of the mystery for today, but also understanding of the prophetic program. Thank you for this great book of John. Uh, we ask that you bless our time uh, in the Q&A as well. We thank you in Christ's name.